Welcome to my third and last video about the geology of Death Valley. In this video, I will explore the factors that make Death Valley the hottest, driest place in North America and how the wind has shaped the land. First, why is it so hot and dry? Let's start with the question of dry. A desert is any place that receives an average of less than 10 inches or 25 centimeters of rain a year. Death Valley receives less than two inches, so yeah, it's a desert all right, but why? A major factor is the rain shadow effect. As moist air blows from the Pacific Ocean, it must rise up over mountains. On the windward side of the mountain, the rising air cools, the moisture condenses, forming clouds and rain, and the rain falls on the windward side of the mountain. As the now dry air descends to the other side, it warms, becoming even drier. That is why the west side of the Sierra is much wetter than the east side. This happens repeatedly as air from the Pacific encounters four major mountain ranges on its way to Death Valley. The extreme temperature of Death Valley is also related to its extreme depth. Everyone knows that it gets colder as you ascend mountains. Dry air expands and cools 5 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet of elevation gain. This is known as adiabatic cooling. Since Death Valley is the deepest basin in North America, it is also the hottest. Also, as the surface of the basin heats up, the hot air rises, but it cools and sinks before it can leave the basin, thanks to the mountains on each side. As if that isn't bad enough, with little rain, there's almost no vegetation to absorb the heat. Rocks and gravel are excellent at absorbing sunlight and re-radiating it as heat. Death Valley recorded the highest natural ground surface temperature on Earth at 201 degrees Fahrenheit. The lack of vegetation holding down the soil means that wind can erode the soil easily. That's exactly what happened here at Devil's Cornfield. This arrowweed plant first started its life when the surface of the land was here. Since then, the wind has blown away the sandy surface, but the arrowweed's roots have held on. This process of lowering of the surface is called deflation. The wind will continue to blow away the sand and silt of the ground until one of three things happen. It will reach bedrock, it will reach the water table, or there will develop a protective layer of pebbles called desert pavement. You might think the floor of the deserts are covered with sand dunes, but actually sand dunes are quite rare. Most desert floors consist of desert pavement, small rocks that protect the sediment below from being blown away. Here, you can see a diagram of a desert pavement forming. If you pick up one of the rocks, you will find sand and silt cowering below. You might also find that the top of the rock is darker than the bottom. The shiny dark surface of exposed rocks is called desert varnish. Desert varnish takes hundreds if not thousands of years to form by a combination of chemical and microbial action. Petroglyphs are often carved into a rock through the thin layer of desert varnish, revealing the lighter layers below. Wind carrying sand can shape rocks creating ventifacts, as in this vesicular basalt rock from the aptly named Ventifact Ridge. Mushroom rock of Death Valley is thought to be an unusually large ventifact, although salt may have had some responsibility for its shape. Notice that the bottom of the rock is more eroded than the top. This may be due to the fact that wind cannot carry sand more than a few inches in the air. The movement of sand by short leaps is called saltation, which means to jump. Only silt and clay, which are dust-sized particles, can be carried high into the air. This is not a sandstorm, it is a dust storm. 
Downwind of Devil's Cornfield is a place where the wind swirls around and drops its sand, the Mesquite Flat Sand Dunes. It's beautiful and much more accessible than the more remote Eureka Sand Dunes of Northern Death Valley. The largest dune seen here has more than one crest, so it is a star dune formed by variable winds. If you climb that sand dune, which I heartily recommend, you will get a great view of a beautiful crescent-shaped or barken dune. Notice that sand dunes have sides that are gradual and sides that are steep. Wind blows the sand up one side of the sand dune. At the top, the sand gets too steep to hold itself up, so it flows down the other side, resting at an angle of 34 degrees. This is known as the angle of repose. Sand dunes tend to migrate downwind because the wind erodes sand on the windward side, brings it to the top of the dune, where it falls down on the protected side of the dune. Heavy rains will seep through the sand and settle in the low areas between the sand dunes, carrying with it tiny clay particles. There will be a short-lived little playa pond that will dry up, leaving behind a layer of mud that exhibits beautiful mud cracks. As you climb sand dunes, stick to the crests or the windward side where the sand grains are packed together. Climbing up a slip face results in a lot of slipping. However, by all means, run down a slip face. Over the years, I have brought hundreds of geology students to Death Valley, and now I got the chance to bring you. Thank you for joining me.